Yep. Okay, cool. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So let me share my screen. All right. Um, so hi everyone. Thank you for coming to our summer briefing. Um, this year we're focusing on the Indo-Pacific region because of our shared history and uh, our common interest. Um, I hope that today we could uh, share our progress uh, very freely and also encourage our collaboration together. Um, my title today is Strengthen Public Information Literacy in Taiwan, um, Research and Communications. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Taiwan's context, I'll introduce ourselves a little bit, I IORG, um, and also what we do in research and communications. As Jeff said, I'm one of the director at IORG. I'm very happy to share our experiences with you and hopefully get your um, feedback on our work. So uh, a very, very brief context of Taiwan as a country. Um, in short, our democracy and in turn, our information environment is very young. Um, 35 years and counting. Um, we experience here some problems in our information environment, pretty much um, as, as much as you would probably uh, experience in your own country. Um, in terms of information manipulation, which is our topic today, um, our first major sort of fake news event happened in 2018, where we had our local elections and referendums back then. Um, IRG right now is working on a research project to better understand what happened back then and uh, uh, perhaps hopefully uh, offer better uh, advice for this year's election that is coming up in November here in Taiwan. So who are we? IRG uh, does two things, research and communications. Um, everything is based on our research and specifically data science research. We've been developing our own information uh, archiving system since 2019 and we collect a lot of different data from different sources. Uh, from Taiwan, for both from Taiwan and in China. Um, based on our data archive, we can develop all kinds of research methodologies. And we published a paper last year in 2021 uh, talking about how rumors spread during COVID-19 in Taiwan's closed social networking platform. But we all know that uh, research in itself is not enough. Um, we think to strengthen our democracy, we need a better informed electorate. So that's why we not only need better, uh, more communication, we need better communication. We need communications that people can trust, that they have a reason to trust. So that's why we've been, we've been publishing research reports that's based on our data science research. And we provide evidence for, the, for, the, for, the, for our readers to make their own informed decisions. Um, we also know that online communication is definitely not enough. So we also have been hosting uh, physical events such as community workshops and teacher, teachers training session. Particularly, we think that working with school teachers in middle and high school is very important That's, uh, so that they can teach information literacy better and to better pre uh, prepare our um, uh, next generation to participate in our public discourse. So a brief uh, summary of uh, our research finding in 2021 so uh, based on our data research, we have provided detailed evidence of CCP's continued information manipulation against us, which means that uh, Chinese outlets have been continuing spreading uh, bad information or problematic information into Taiwan's information uh, environment, try to influence Taiwanese readers. Some of the topic included uh, saying good things about China's vaccine, uh, bad things and untruthful things about Taiwanese vaccines, uh, US pork, which, which is being imported into Taiwan, um, criticizing Taiwan's allies, including the US and also Japan, um, and of course, criticizing Taiwan's current government of quote unquote, plotting for independence. Um, we also found support of these Chinese narratives from Taiwan, including some of the local media outlets here, um, some celebrities, politicians, and so-called uh, island netizens. That is a phrase that uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party outlet use to sort of quote internet comments to support in support uh, of their own narratives. Um, our data science research also found that not all, not every piece of bad information comes from China, right? Um, there's also notable domestic narratives that are doing bad things influencing our public discourse. 
Um, one common and recurring uh, theme is so-called what uh, is something called rigged votes or rigged elections that always appear around elections. Um, since since these narratives comes from Taiwan, uh, spoken by Taiwanese people, they are technically or almost all of them are protected by our constitution uh, as a free democracy. So I, that's why we think to better strengthen our democracy, we need public. Uh, we need better public information literacy and better public trust. Some of the recent, re more recent research this year, um, in March, we studied Mandarin narratives that relates to Russia, uh, that relates to the Russia Ukraine, Ukraine war that is still going on right now. Um, these narratives we found mainly do three things: one, to justify Russia's invasion into Ukraine; two, to create confusion about the war; three to demoralize defense. That is to say that Ukraine cannot defend itself and it ex an extension saying that Taiwan cannot, ex uh, cannot defend itself. Um, to share our research further, we also worked with Ukraine Taiwan Forum um, to, trans to produce a Ukrainian version of our report. Um, in March, we did a report on uh, Chinese official narratives praising Chinese strategy in controlling, in controlling COVID-19 what they call dynamic COVID zero strategy. Um, these narratives also criticize the West of giving up and what they say lying flat and coexist with the virus and ended up comparing Chinese governance model and saying that it is su more superior to the Western model. Um, just last month, we did a report uh, exposing something called a clustered posting on Facebook, which is a group of Facebook page posting the same thing in a very short amount of time. Um, that report uh, got a lot of attention here in Taiwan and also highlighted uh, Facebook as a platform probably needs to work a little harder in terms of reducing the reach of these uh, suspicious content farms on their own uh, platform. One ongoing research project that we are going right now is reviewing what we call a U.S. skepticism here in Taiwan's information environment. And so far, we've uh, we've uh, we've uh, structured or categorized these narratives into two, uh, into five categories: abandonment, strength, chaos, fake friends, and collusion. And all of these narratives has sort of a common effect: is that to make Taiwan keep neutral and do not provoke China to keep distance from the U.S. Um, we'll would be happy to share our uh, com completed research with all of you and I also look forward to your input uh, since this is a common probably a common issue in our region. So um, next is communications. I want to mention just two things. Uh, one is our book that's been published uh, I think last month yeah in the middle of last month. Um, this book was really designed to be a guide to information literacy for especially uh, middle and high school students and teachers. Uh, it will serve as an overview of our information environment and also points out the challenges that we face, such as information manipulation that we're talking about today and something and other things such as propaganda. Um, in this book, we also pr propose something called information credibility evaluation framework. Um, that is something that we think would help us to understand and in a more structured way decide if a piece of information is credible or trustworthy or not. Um, we think we are currently in a process of developing this framework to be uh, to become an open standard meaning that uh, it has to be more inclusive but also based on concrete on scientific and academic research we're also we're even talking to for example cognitive neuroscientists to figure out what what a message would do to a person to influence their behavior and so on and so forth um recently uh, my colleagues and I started a, a, a sort of a, a, a social media campaign to to sort of use this framework to evaluate uh, popular rumors that's been spreading in Taiwan's information space. For example, these are three examples that we did uh, three weeks of, you know, past week and then a week before that and then one week before that. So we think this might be a really good start for, for one, to, for people to know about, you know, these are the common rumors that's being spread in our information space that we need to, uh, we need to take notice of. And two, to compare results. For example, one, one rumor, two, pe two people might have uh, different uh, evaluation results for one rumor. And if we offer them a framework, it will, and 
that uh, that we hope this would um, this would inspire a more constructive and more uh, structured discussion on what to trust and what to not to trust and why do you trust and why do you trust that. Now we think this will be better for our public discourse in Taiwan. So um, to briefly conclude, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you to IRG's uh, partners. Um, we would not be able to do what we do without our partners, including TAF today. Thank you very much. Um, and also, I want to thank you for coming to listening to our, our sharing. Um, and hopefully, we'll have a, a very fruitful discussion uh, very soon. Thank you. OK, thank you very much Zhao, for following the rules. It's like exactly 10 minutes. Thank you for that. It's a very uh, precise and, and concise uh, presentation. And we, uh, so next, we will have the next speaker uh, will be, I think it, is it in Taiwanese, uh, Chen uh, Zhan Xingke, uh, Senior Research Manager at Madurka Center for Opinion Research. And we actually uh, received uh, Shinge's contact info from a Mal Malaysian media called Tai Jing a few weeks ago. Uh, at that time, IRG was invited to do a podcast on Chinese propaganda under the recent outbreak of COVID. And as we are organizing this event, we ask our friend at Tai Jing for people who studied information manipulation in, Mala uh, in Malaysia. And he recommended immediately uh, uh, Shinge. Uh, the center he worked for is an opinion research firm that acts as a bridge between Malaysians and the leading members of the society um, by collecting opinion, uh, public opinion and expressing them through survey results, analysis, and position papers. And now I would like to give the floor uh, to Sinket, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon to everyone. So, uh, my name is Sinket from Malaysia. Uh, I will just uh, try to present the snapshots uh, of the survey that we done uh, last year that's uh to try to uh my actually my topic of the presentation is uh is actually a dis disinformation ideology uh, ideological a survey on malaysian publics on the information warfare in, in malaysia so i today presentation i try to be emphasized a, li a little bit more on the malaysian chinese although the uh, survey will be covering the whole population including Malay, uh, Malay, Chinese, Indians, and uh, all the some of the other native. So the study is conducted in uh, throughout a three three months, April, May, June, in two thousand one. So it's a uh, it's a purport, it's a representative sample for for the whole the whole country. So I go straight to the presentation. There's two part. I just want to show some of the social media behavior of the Malaysian population and also. Um, why I would say that is sometimes it's more like ideological things rather than the disinformation warfare. So this is the user behavior for the Malaysian uh, for the Malaysian publics. You can see that um, WhatsApp is almost like uh, occupied so eighty percent of the behavior. Uh, eighty percent of the respondent claim they are using WhatsApp daily. So then face followed by Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and uh, Telegram, WeChat, and uh, Twitter. But if let's say we go into a detailed breakdown by all these uh, some of the social democratic background, then you can see that WeChat actually mostly used by Malaysian Chinese uh, here, where thirty percent of the respondents say they use uh, WeChat. But compared to other populations in the country, Malay, Indians, or other native, then you can see that the uses of WeChat are very very low. But then again, there are also some of the this uh, age age uh, difference where Older people will be on the Facebook, then the younger people uh, is, is on the Instagram and other kind of tools. So some of the social media platform we didn't include here, here like the Xiao Hong Su, the uh, the written red books, is increasing become a popular among the teenager in Malaysia. So we hope that in future we will include that as well. So then we asked about the the respondent how frequent they share message or post. In the Facebook, Instagram, and only like five percent of people say they always are offered. A lot of people say no, but but then we ask about how frequent they forward uh, message, uh, the instant messaging message. Then a slightly higher percentage, about six. Uh, combined is about seven percent. Say often they always means that they always uh, forward something. 
then half of the respondents say they sometimes they forwards. So you, you can see that uh, there's a slightly different on from on the Facebook and Instagram and so on. But then more people are forwarding message in the instant messaging. So it makes us uh, more difficult for us to trace some of these uh, so for if uh, this in this information uh, thing due to the privacy issue. Well, sometimes you on social uh, on Facebook and other Twitter and other platform, we still can trace a, uh, some of it. But in the private uh, instant messenger, then it makes us more difficult. So we also ask uh, what kind of message they forward. So then you can see the different uh, response from the different uh, social demo social demographic. I try to highlight here where the Malaysian Chinese and Malaysian Indian. They try to force the political news, uh, either domestic or international. While the the Malay will likely forward something that more more sensational kind of things, and more into uh, more fun kind of thing. Then we also ask, uh, do you verify before you forward? Then we got something very interesting. Um, most of the people claim they verified before the forward. Uh, well, the Malaysian Chinese will be maybe it's more honest. Say no, they didn't uh, verify. About sixty percent say they didn't verify before they forward. Well, only only uh, uh, slightly more than a third of the population of uh, the Malaysian Chinese says they verified before they they forward the message. So we also ask how frequent they encounter the fake news. Like seventy three percent, three quarter of the uh, respondents say. They encountered the face, uh, fake news before, but then there's a difference between the demographics, uh, lower income people less, higher income people more kind of things. Then what we asked about what kind of fake news they they got. Uh, this one is referring to 2021, and half of the response said is about the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, a little bit about Malaysia guard politics, and only two percent claimed about the international uh, new uh, related uh, fake news. Then we ask, will you have accidentally or intentionally forward some of the uh, the so called the fake news or disinformation? Or uh, around average twelve percent of the people claim yes, they they done that before. But then again, with a higher percentage from the Malaysian Chinese respondent, about 18% said, yeah, they forwarded something uh, not true before. Then if we say go by demography, then you, we also see something very interesting trend where higher income people tend to be uh, say that they're, they're uh, involved in some of the uh, uh, information, fake news, different information before compared to the low income, higher on the urban uh, population compared to the rural people. So we ask whether it's intention or intention. A lot of people say no, they are they are unaware about the fake news before they forward, and uh, we have this kind of finding. Then we ask where are these uh, fake news, uh, this movie come from? A lot of people claims are uh, from the page or some of the account they don't know, and some of it's from a politician, uh, some just some other page. So, yeah. Then we ask that, uh, okay, why I ask this is, uh, why we say that it sometimes is uh, kind of ideological because I want to show you two uh, questions about international, but how the Malaysians uh, view about uh, two, uh, two, strong, two superpower in the, in the world. First, we ask about America, United States, how they view about United States. Again, you can see that the very polarized uh, kind of things. Um, most of the Malay, the uh, the uh, dislike us the major reason behind it is because of the region conflicts in uh, the 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 conflict in the middle east uh in the about uh the palestinian and the israeli where the malaysian chinese uh are slightly more than half uh dislike us for some of the uh, some of the reasons that we are show later where the Malaysian Indians, I think because, because their connection to the uh, Indian co continent, so they are slightly more pro-US uh, in this sense. And this is the reason we ask why they like uh, this like uh, US. Then you can see that a lot of people talk about racial issue in US against the Muslims and so on. Then we ask about China. Um, do you what's the view about China? Then you can see overwhelming the Malaysian Chinese seventy seven percent say. They have a positive view about China. Only fifteen percent have a negative view. While the Malay, uh, about about 
fifty uh, percent have a negative view of China, and but also higher percentage of people who view China positively. Um, in this in this sense, so the reason is uh, economic growth. But the the reason for a positive view for China is about uh, is uh, economic growth, COVID, and so on. So then from here, we asked about uh, one of the contextual issue over the last few years. We asked about um, what, what do you think about the Uyghur issue in Xinjiang? Then you got a very polarized uh, kind of response. The uh, Malay, which are Muslim, they see, they see that the, the Uyghur are being oppressed in China. Uh, for about half, 49% say it's been oppressed. Only 25% say it's exaggerated by the Western media. Welcome to Malaysian Chinese because they close relationship with the mainland China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. So they receive a lot of this information from mainland as well as Taiwan, some of the pro, uh, some of the blue media that uh, mentioned before. So 61% of think that uh, actually the issue in Xinjiang being exaggerated. Only 12% think that uh, the Uyghur have been oppressed in China. So you got already polarized when we correlated with the image of the country. So they would just believe that uh, some of the information from China without uh, thinking that, and they just share or forward some of the message without so much of filtering or verifications. While the other part of the population will think that uh, they were they also the they viewed about some of these issue of color by their view about the country so the reason they dislike china the reason they dis dislike us and so on so we also asked about a question uh, this question only among the malaysians uh malaysians uh, chinese uh what they viewed about the hong kong protest uh, happens uh, in the past in the two uh, one eight and one nine then you can see that uh, 33% of the Malaysian Chinese say that it's a US conspiracy that's responsible for the Hong Kong issue. While 10% say it's a Hong Kong CEO, the 3% talking about the Hong Kong police, 10% blame the Beijing officer, and 7% blame the Hong Kong uh, opposition. But um, although these things seem like a bit worrying for some of the some of the view, some of the audience. But we also need to highlight the, the difference between the generation. You can see that, uh, which highlights some of the uh, red circle here. Those age 40 and above are slightly buy into this uh, China uh, propaganda where they think that the Hong Kong protest is uh, US is behind all this. Where the younger population, you can, would be more independent minded or less uh, this uh, sentimental connection with the China, uh, the culture type kind of thing. Then think that uh, is less so a U.S. conspiracy theory. Is uh, some are talking about uh, Hong Kong chief executive, or some would say it's a Beijing. Uh, uh, Beijing should respons responsible responsible for the violence uh, in the Hong Kong protest. So this is some of the snapshots. So uh, we also asked a question: uh, What do you think about the COVID nineteen kind of thing? Is the from the lab or from the natural disasters? Uh, is a natural disease kind of thing. You can see a very polarized uh, response across the different demography. Um, the Malay would think that is from the labs. It's either the China or US behind it. While the Malaysian Chinese would think that is the kind of natural things is, and so on. So we can see that um, the ideological the view about some of these um, uh, big country it color their color their response to some of these uh, news. This, this news or propaganda or disinformation. So some of it, they just believe it, even though we think we uh, some of the Malaysian journalists, media try to say that some of these are fake news, but some of it still believe this, some of this conspiracy theory. So this is a snapshot, a short one. Uh, I hope I keep my time and we can have more discussion later. Thank you. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Hinge, for your presentation. And apologies again for mixing up the order. Actually, uh, the first, uh, the second speaker should be uh, Professor O'Neill. And I will now pass the floor to you. Uh, just a, also a few words on, on Professor O'Neill. <clears throat> so Professor O'Neill is an uh, associate prof uh, professor of communication at the University of Canberra's News and Media Research Center. 
The center is actually uh, Australia's only specialist research center dedicated to exploring news consumption, social and digital uh, networks, and the legal, ethnical, and social impact of communication technologies. If I'm not mistaken, Professor uh, Matthew is currently co-developing new approaches to media literacy in the attention economy. And today I believe he would like to share some uh, fact-checking methods that he was developing for schools. Uh, thank you, uh, I will yield the floor to you then. Thank you. I'm trying to put up my slides, but I'm not very good with Google. I don't, this program, I don't use it very often, so can't I'll see my, maybe I'll just, sorry, yep. Uh, so at the bottom, there's a few bottom uh, right, you can press. Yeah, yeah no, I know, but I just can't see my, I can't see my, the slides that I want. Um, sorry about this. Um, not every or would you like to send uh, me the link of your material so I can share it for you on my um, screen? I think I'll just talk to it. It's okay. Yeah, sure, um, sure. yeah I'll just I'll just talk if that's okay. So hi everybody, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'd like to pay uh, to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Nambri people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I sit. Um, so this is a project which is about trying to develop some fundamental foundational fact-checking principles so it has to be inclusive it has to be as broad as possible and to include as many people as possible um, so we, we want to develop fundamental fact-checking principles and that are adapted to the current online media ecosystem um, and so the current media ecosystem has been described as an attention economy uh, that is to say, every day we solicited by, you know, thousands of stimulations, thousands of prompts. Um, so that has to be, so that means that fact checking should be quick, should be fast. Because we constantly have to make judgments about what's worth our attention. Another issue is whether we should have a critical perspective in, in, uh, in Australia. There's a lot of focus on media literacy as being critical in the sense of you know, looking at how minorities are represented, uh, ethnic minorities, for example, um, you know, stigmatization of certain groups, etc. So, you know, we agree with that in principle, but it, this could be seen as partisan. It's important to, to be perceived as non-partisan, to once again be as inclusive as possible. So we try not to use a critical perspective so much. Um, and then the third uh, difficulty that we have are you are you hearing me okay? Because I'm I'm hearing this sort of echo. Is it is the sound okay or? Oh uh, that, yeah, um, I'm hearing you okay. Yeah. Okay. Ask Jeff. Hello? Jeff, would you mute? Yeah, but otherwise yeah. sounds okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So there's a, there's a cultural issue as well. Is that we actually um, advocate the use of Wikipedia as a fact checking resource and there's a lot of resistance to that traditionally in the teaching community because they see Wikipedia as unreliable and so we, there's a kind of education towards teachers um, and everyone else that has to happen. Um, so what we, what, we, um, what we do is that we, we look at different methods, uh, we've looked at different fact checking methods and we've, we've found the uh, civic online reasoning methodology from Stanford University, which was uh, developed by Sam Weinberg, uh, which basically says um, that, you know, a lot of people get their information online. So you need to be able to, to have the tools to verify information. It's not what you know that matters, it's how you verify. Um, and a lot of the, the ways that people used to decide what was trustworthy on online don't work anymore because it used to be that if a website didn't look very professional, if it didn't look very good, you could you could sort of make up your mind that it wasn't authentic. Um, you know, if there was, um, the, if the layout wasn't good, or if there weren't any footnotes, um, and so you know that doesn't work anymore because now everybody can make a really good looking website. So there's, you have to have to have another methodology. Um, you you don't want to. Uh, to engage deeply, basically. So what can you do? So what the uh, people at Stanford have come up with is this concept of lateral, lateral reading. I don't know if anybody has heard about that. So lateral reading means if you, could, if you come across something that's dubious or that you're not sure about, you, uh, you, you don't engage deeply. You look away, look aside. You open another tab, another window on your browser, and you do a check, a quick check. 
Um, so how do you do that? Well, um, well, there's another, I'll just give you another example of these methods. There's a, another guy, uh, Mike Coldfield, who comes up, who's come up with a SIFT methodology. SIFT is stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, and trace the claims back. So he's basically used the lateral reading methodology, but he's added this idea of that you trace where the information of the image comes from. Um, so this is great, but where do you check? You know, where can you find reliable information that's cheap, that's free, um, and that's, you know, exhaustive and encyclopedic? So this is where we, we innovate in two ways. First, because of the age of the children that we're working with. So we have a project with three schools um, in Canberra, and their children, uh, year five and six, four, five, six, I think, so that's around nine, 10, 11. And usually people who do media literacy, they work with uh, teenagers. So this is one of the innovations that we're trying to uh, start earlier. Uh, and the other innovation is that we recommend the use of Wikipedia. And uh, Wikipedia in English uh, used to be, um, you know, there used to be some issues uh, in terms of unreliability. Uh, but now I think because of the maturity of the project um, and because of the number of people on pages where, which are important, which are big topics, um, you know, there's a lot of people contributing. So anybody who tries to manipulate something or to uh, add something facetious or wrong, there will be, uh, you know, people will, will correct it very, very quickly. And the, uh, the pages are usually very good quality. So once again, this is mainly for large topics on, uh, on, uh, on English Wikipedia that I'm talking about. I'm not making a general claim about all the different Wikipedia projects, obviously. Um, and so it's a, it's a move from the, you know, the, the certainty that you have with Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica, you have a, a certainty that's based on the brand, on the reputation of the brand. And here it's, it's more of a guarantee based on the process, you know, like the process is going to help you um, decide that you can trust Wikipedia because it's transparent. Every change to, a, to an article is archived in the history um, page of that article. Uh, the, there's a talk page where people discuss why this should be emphasized and you know so you can actually see how the what, what, what's happening in the kitchen if you like and so that's also quite important when you're dealing with people who uh, believe in conspiracy theories because it's always about these secret cabals who do things in secret and Wikipedia it's all transparent everything's right there you know all the changes are explained you have to justify them they have all these policies so it kind of helps fight against these conspiracy theories. Um, so basically, uh, we've then developed some lesson plans uh, for kids. Um, so we've got a series of six lesson plans. The first one is basically saying what's, what should you trust? What kind of information is real? How do you know that the earth is round? You know, you're told it is, but how can you tell? Uh, and so then we introduce the concept of the encyclopedia. And then we, second one, we talk about uh, Wikipedia. And then we have a sort of uh, another four lessons that are kind of little scenarios engaging uh, children to try and think about, uh, you know, when they should fact check. And so they go from very simple to more complex. Um, and there's the first one is, for example, what if you found a sandwich on the street? Um, you know, would you eat it? If you had a friend who gave it to you and you trusted the friend, you would. But if, you, if somebody that you didn't know gave you a sandwich, you probably wouldn't trust it. Well, it's the same thing with information. Information that you don't know, if you're not sure, stop, open another window, do a quick check, look at the Wikipedia article. And there also has to be a little bit of education about, you know, we, different Wiki, Wikipedia articles. There's some good resources from the Wikimedia Foundation in Wikimedia Education. You know, like, does the article have a lot of references? Does it have a, a warning banner at the top? If it's got a warning banner, of course, then there's an issue with it. If it doesn't have any references, then it, you know, those sorts of things you have to watch. You have to educate also about using Wikipedia, obviously. Um, another scenario is about ad hominem attacks uh, to the person attack. So, you know, sometimes you have fights with your friends um, and that's okay because you, you know them and you can say sorry after, but why are people getting so mad online? Why, is they, why are they insulting somebody they don't even know? If that seems a bit funny, then you should check. Um, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, so it, it's kind of repetition and we always finish in the same way. If you're not sure about something, stop and check. Um, and then there's a couple others, you know, like for example, uh, the red car fallacy, you know, if you, if you have a red car, suddenly you start seeing red cars everywhere. So 
you've never heard about something and suddenly you see that information everywhere. So ubiquity of certain types of information, once again. And then the, the final one is called Garage Dragon. Um, and it's based on a story by Carl Sagan, the astrophysicist, about so a friend tells you he has a, 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 a dragon in the garage. And you say, wow, that's great, I want to see it. And uh, you go and, oh, it's not, there's nothing there. Well, it's an invisible dragon. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's, uh, you know, put some fl flower in the air so we can see it. Well, no, it's floating. So they keep shifting the boundaries. So it's about, you know, how do you develop, uh, you know, when you, saw those, when you see those sorts of narratives where the, narr the, the goalpost and the, the boundaries keep shifting, you should try and see, you should see that as, a, as an alert as well. So it's basically trying to develop a sense of when should I fact check something in children. Um, that's it. Sorry, I didn't, I couldn't get the slides up. Um, but um, maybe if there's any questions after, you can, I can try and work it out or, or something like that. But, so, yep, I don't know how I did for time, but um, hopefully I'm okay. Perfect, perfect. The, the timing is very good. Okay then. Uh, thank you, Professor Matthew, again for your presentation. And now I think we can have like a five minutes break. Uh, just for everyone to grab a, co uh, a coffee, water, a cup of water, or just go to the bathroom. And we will be back in five minutes, okay, at uh, one, uh, like in Taipei time, it's 1.55. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll see you, see you all later then. Okay, I think time's up. <laughs> all right. Okay. Is everyone back already? I think we are still missing our final speaker, right? Dr. Aris hasn't showed up. Um, if that's the case, then anyway, we'll just proceed uh, to our uh, fourth speaker. Ms. Kawahala, and then if at that time, uh, Dr. Aris still hasn't come, then we will just move into the final free uh, discussion part. Is that okay for everyone? All right, then. Uh, okay, also a few words to introduce uh, Ms. Kawahala. Um, she's now a research fellow at the Japan Institute of in International Affairs. Her research in interests include public diplomacy, political warfare, soft power, sharp power, and of course, disinformation campaigns, among other things. Today, the topic of her presentation is defending democracies from disinformation threats. She will share her views on Japan's disinformation situation and potential areas of collaboration between Taiwan and Japan. Uh, I will give the floor now to Ms. Kuwahala. Uh, do you need me to uh, share the presentation for you, or can you share your screen? Hi, Jeff. Uh, I'm Kyoko Kuwahara. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this um, such a great um, event today. And I would like you to uh, share my slide instead of me. Is that okay for me, for you? Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Not clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Kyoko Kuhara, a research, research fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. And today I'm going to talk about uh, disinformation uh, campaigns um, in order to defend the democracies from disinformation threats and also um, some disinformation cases in Japan and uh, as well as a future cooperation, international cooperation, as well as uh, Taiwan-Japan cooperation. Next slide, please. So with the rapid progress of communication technology, and Democracy worldwide is now facing great challenges of disinformation threats because um, it could polarize public opinion and endanger people's lives and political stability. 
As you can see, the agenda setting process model on this slide, policy agenda is closely related to public agenda, which is affected by media agenda, as well as external communication and issues or events. So this information could have a negative impact on this democratic agenda setting process. Next slide, please. So why has this information gathering attention recently? Russia's campaign are well known, including its intervention in Crimea and Donbas in 2014, and US presidential ele election in 2016. Today, however, this information is widely recognized as a serious threat to a very foundation of democracy with the penetration of social media and the spread of COVID-19, as well as Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Especially amid the, amid the pandemic, this information about the virus and vaccines have flooded all over the world, and this information threats has become acknowledged globally. Even US President Biden said platformers such as Facebook killing people on their services. Next slide, please. So talking about Japan, Chinese interference is well recognized in Japan, whose aim is to foster positive views of China in Japan, um, and more strategically, to weaken the US-Japan alliance. On the other hand, there are little electoral or other disinformation campaign being conducted in Japan from overseas. Also, foreign interference, including Chinese influence operations in Japan, have had more limited success than in other democracies. There, were, there are many false rumors during natural disasters in Japan, for instance, the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake, um, as you all may know, and the 2016 Kumamoto earthquake prompted the spread of false rumors, rumors in Japan. But these were not the disinformation campaigns conducted by other countries. All arose domestically, which were not spread for political or economic gain. Regarding the Great East, uh, East Japan earthquake in 2011, various uh, false rumors were spread online, including hazardous materials would fall from the sky with the rain, for instance, because of the fire at the Cosmo oil refinery in, in, refinery in uh, Chiba. Also regarding the Kumamoto earthquake in 2016, there was a famous um, disinformation that a lion saying that a lion escaped from the tube because of the quake. As you can see the actual tweet in the slide. So in Japan, nearly all misinformation or disinformation spreading during disasters arises domest domestically, which will not spread for political economic gain. Various reasons can be considered for Japan's, this Japan's unique uh, disinformation environment and situations. It is said that Japan has historically been isolated from foreign migration and investments, and there are cultural, linguistic, and economic separation from other countries. It is called, sometimes called Galapagos syndrome. It is also true that there are little foreign media presence in Japan. One of the main reasons is that there are five Japanese media conglomerates or companies dominating Japan's media environments. Thus, the information space is very much limited, leaving little um, room for foreign interference. So considering these reasons, this information countermeasures are very very much limited in Japan. Make Ministry of Interna Internal Affairs and Communications could be the only ministry with, which has tackled disinformation countermeasures, but only for fake news or f uh, false rumors uh, spread domestically. Also, the um, strategic communications efforts has been conducted by MOD, Ministry of Defense, include tackling disinformation campaigns from overseas, but 
their activities seems seem to be limited to the um, MOD itself at this moment. So next slide, please. Oh, mm, sorry. And um, would you go back to the format slide? Yes, please. Thank you. So, however, situation that Japan has less experience of foreign disinformation campaigns may change in coming years. Uh, for instance, as AI uh, translation or other technologies improve in accuracy, their, bar um, their barriers in Japan could be broken. And this information campaign, of course, could um, present serious threats to Japan as well. There is a real possibility of Taiwan Strait contingency, and there is growing concerns among Japanese elites and media. It is said that in the event, a great deal of um, China, uh, China, China's disinformation could be spread in Japan as well. So how can we fight against disinformation and what is the future Japan-Taiwan cooperation? It is important for every country and region to strengthen its own cross ministerial efforts as well as governmental communication strategies expanding fact-checking services and functions, facilitating public-private co private cooperation um, involving private organization, media, and platformers, and educating uh, children, its people, to improve media literacy or information literacy for a capacity building. At the same time, countermeasures should be balanced with um, free speech and journalism in promoting disinformation countermeasures. For instance, Brazil and Hungary um, have made attempts to crack down on disinformation uh, through legislation such as anti-fake news laws as part of their efforts to combat uh, COVID-19. However, some international NGOs has criticized these governments for uh, arbitrarily restricting citizens' freedom of expression. So freedom of expression must be secured and should not be undermined. Any regulations by governments and discussion should be pursued. Lastly, for all democracies, it is necessary to cooperate with like-minded countries and regions sharing the same values, challenges, and experiences facilitating information security cooperation or building a counter disinformation framework with other democracies could be considered one of the uh, considered for one of the forms of international cooperation it could be pursued with quad framework or uh, asean countries Japan has little experience and insufficient countermeasures against um, disinformation, which means that it has much to learn from other countries and democracies. As for cooperation with Taiwan, lastly, Japan has recognized that the importance of uh, peace and stabi stability across the Taiwan Strait, highlighting security cooperation with the international security a security a international society amid China's rise. Effective collaboration and cooperation in this um, in other area would strengthen each national security for uh, Japan and for both uh, for both Japan and Taiwan. Taiwan and Japan has many things in common and cooperation holds great potential for both. So thank you so much for your attention. Any thoughts and comments are welcome during our uh, following discussion. Now let's go back to Jeff, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Kuala san uh, Let me just check if uh, Dr. Aris responded to my email. Uh, for I'm looking not. Okay, then in this case, I think we can just uh, go to the next part, the free discussion part. And actually, we have already collected a few questions in the Google uh, document notes here. And uh, 
does anyone want to like just ask a question verbally because <laughs> i think uh we have questions here and people can just like add anything any comments you want like, uh, afterward but if you want to have like a direct interaction or a question being answered by all the participants here you can just raise your hand and then ask a question right now in person i think that will also be nice there's a couple questions for me so if you want i can i can go through them oh yeah sure that'd be nice uh, let me see um okay yeah just uh pick uh any i mean I, I don't mind so um i mean there's something for Sinkyad as well i've got one for Sinkyad actually but i'll um so just about inclusion um just about you know not putting people off basically um so basically what i was going back to what i was saying about the critical perspective or not um there's a lot of you know as, as university lecturers we we tend to be quite critical uh but people could see that as being partisan you know as being for one side or against the other we try to avoid that and just talk about you know correctness of information because that that way we'll get m more buy-in um and uh that that's anyway that's the approach that we've taken um sorry matthew uh it's my yeah. question um do you mind giving an example that that you maybe encountered of people questioning you you know for being partisan because we also get that sometimes here in taiwan right um just no, I mean, learn from your experience i haven't sorry uh, i think it's on my screen yeah, on no. my camera some something also looks weird um I mean, no, we haven't encountered it, but precisely because we avoid it. So it's just that it's more a reference to other efforts in Australia. You know, there's a lot of people in Australia, uh, particularly there's an organization called ALIA, which is the Australian um, Literacy you know, Association or something like that. And they, they kind of have very much a focus on uh, disadvantaged people, you know, lower economic, lower income people, indigenous people, their access to media, their media literacy, um, and that really informs their, their, you know, what they're putting out there. And, and you know, once again, I'm total, total respect for that. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with the, with the intention. It's just that if you're trying to convince parents of school children that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing something that's in their kids' interest, it, 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 we think it's probably uh, more going to work better if you don't have such a, a clear agenda, political agenda, that's, that's all. But, I, you know, this is very much about the Australian context. I don't know if it's going to translate to other contexts. Um, no, I can, I can briefly say that here in Taiwan also, in terms of education in schools, right, uh, people have sort of a natural tendency of not talking about politics or just shy away from it. And, of course, it has good and bad uh, effects as well yeah um so then the other one um are you thinking about evaluating the effectiveness um yes yeah, so what we've done is we've done um we, we sort of this is really just started in february like we the actual project itself and there's been a lot of disruptions because of covid um because of uh, you know poor working conditions in schools i think that you know schools are going on strike on friday so uh, teachers are very overwhelmed, you know, so it's, it's been hard to get people to work with. Um, but um, we, we did, what we did was we did a, a survey uh, before the start with very five basic, super basic questions. You know, um, if you read on TikTok that, uh, you know, eating avocado will cure cancer, would you believe it? And uh, yes, uh, everything on TikTok is true, uh, no. Uh, or uh, three, I would check, right? And and we try, you know, th this is a, just an example. And then one of them was, you, what's your opinion of Wikipedia? And it, Wiki, opinion of Wikipedia was very negative. Um, and so we've we've we're doing we're in the middle of doing uh, we've done lessons one and two. We're in the middle of doing three and four. And after three and four, we'll take we'll do we'll re-administer the survey with the questions in a slightly different order. And then that will be a way to measure the effectiveness of the project in terms of fact-checking uh, but you know we could also do tests 
stuff. You know, this is all, uh, but the, the, the big way we collect information is also by talking to the teachers directly. We don't go into the schools ourselves because we, uh, the ethics um, requirement would be very onerous. Uh, when you're dealing with children, it's quite complicated. So we, we just go through the teachers and we, we have debrief sessions with the teachers and that's worked pretty well because they tell us what works, uh, what doesn't work. They give us ideas. So it's kind of a good, a good process to work with the teachers directly. Um, yeah. Um, so do we, we don't use any other resources. Um, you know, there, there are lots, there's uh, RMIT has a fact checking, uh, uh, agency that works with the ABC, the Australian Bro Broadcasting Corporation. I mean, I, we, we're in touch with them, but th once again, this is about ease of access. Um, and so that's why we just say, just go to Wikipedia because that's got everything you need. It's, you know, you could find better information probably, you know, about geography here, about, you know, statistics there, but at least on Wikipedia, it's all in one place. So that, that's the, that's the benefit. Um, and, um, I think that, oh yes. Yeah, so individual responsibility. So coming from India, um, well, I mean, I don't see that it's any different. It's just about, you know, how you approach, um, you know, I mean, information coming from the mass media um, can also be biased. So if you're not sure about it, just check, you know, it's any kind of information that you encounter can, can be checked, I think. So it doesn't matter. I mean, obviously this is more about online information, but it, it can also apply to the mass media. Um, and the great thing about Wikipedia is that you know the community enforces the rules so as long as the community is robust there's there's no problem there's only been one case i'll just finish with this because i've been dominating but there's one case where the community was not diverse and was very polarized it's in croatia uh in 2003 the serbo croatian wikipedia community was split into different linguistic projects and the croatian community was taken over by far-right extremists and they excluded people and they rewrote history. And so they're trying to fix it now, but usually it, the diversity of perspectives resolves into a consensus. And that's a really powerful model for producing knowledge collectively and that everybody can agree with. I don't know if it's possible everywhere, but um, that's that's the model that we that they strive for. So thanks. Maybe we can ask Senkia. <laughs> I had a question for Senkia. It's just, um, when you're asking people, have you been exposed to misinformation? Um, you know, the, the risk, I guess, is if you don't define exactly what, what is misinformation and what isn't, people might misidentify misinformation. Um, you know, like one person's misinformation is another person's information. So unless you say, right, this is clearly false, this is clearly right, did you, were you exposed to that one? Were you exposed? If, you, if you ask them to self, uh, you know, nominate that there's a, there's maybe a risk don't you think i don't know okay um i try to respond to some of the question uh question here uh may i just respond to chi hao uh chi hao first uh you're asking about why the different community malay and chinese uh, have the different uh view uh, okay, I just go through briefly. Malaysia is a very diverse country where we have um, three major uh, ethnic groups and also some of the natives uh, in the country. While the majority of the population is a Malay, who are pre I would say 100% are Muslim, where they are colored by this uh, Muslim solidarity and where they are very anti America or anti West due to the Is uh, Israel and Palestinian issue. So that's why uh, we have another ongoing kind of thing, national, uh, monitoring about what's how the Ukraine and Russian war impacts on some of this propaganda uh, disinformation in Malaysia, where they are buying more into the Russia thing, which I think you also uh, probably you have noticed some of the peer research published recently and say that uh, a lot more Malaysian are pro-Russia compared to sympathetic to the Ukraine kind of thing. So this is how the world view, so it's affected uh, how they see the world. So even some of these things, we uh, this information of fake news, they just believe it and they just share and without so much uh, kind of thing. Because they, uh, for them, this ideologically is an anti-America, anti-West kind of thing. Where for the Malaysian, pop, uh, Malaysian Chinese, 
90% uh, of them can speak some Mandarin or uh, some Mandarin, uh, and then the rest will be the English educated, uh, only uh, on the dialect side. So for this Malaysian Chinese, um, it's a very uh, different in terms of age group where the older one, predominant, predominant are Mandarin educated, uh, they speak Mandarin only. Uh, low low uh, competency on English or other language. Where the younger Malaysian Chinese are a bit more multilingual, they can speak Mandarin, they can speak English and uh, maybe some other language. That's why the worldview are quite different. And, and also due to the, set, the only satellite TV services we have here called Astro, and most of the Mandarin channel here are from mainland or Taiwan. The Taiwan one is only quite blue. We, like, example like TVBS, some of these things is very uh, pro KMT, very pro mainland kind of thing. So they only receive, mainly receive the, receiving this kind of TV channel. So uh, so this is how they shape the worldview. So anything to talk about China is great. China is good in COVID. So everyone just share about it. And uh, fight uh, Western vaccine is not good. So side effect is great. So everyone just share about it. So it's more like ideological thing. That's why I link to the, the other question that um, Jeff asked um, why there's a different view about the Hong Kong issue. I think it's because the behavior. So older people depend on the traditional media, on news and uh, they sh how they shape their worldview and ideologically. Where the younger one, more diverse kind of uh, language competency, they watch Westerns, uh, Netflix and some other things more, where they have very different and other channel uh, information receiving and the other thing i want to mention about those people who age 50 and above right so uh, they have these sentimental values about men and china culturally and also some of these uh we also notice some of these uh english educated malaysian chinese who are very pro china and the reason is is because uh they've been grow up in the 60s 70s during the vietnam war so it's also very anti uh western uh uh kind of thing so we have this kind of english educated malaysian chinese who are very pro china so we try to split try to understand some of the reasoning behind it so we have that, those kind of things so hopefully this explain the these two first two questions where the the media consumption behavior is very very different so we also shape the, the outcome and also the language and the older generation sentimental and the other thing is the more domestic is about uh malaysian chinese is a minority here where we are always having a kind of issue uh, on the discriminations from the majority group where that's why they some of it they believe that a uh, stronger china will benefit uh, malaysian chinese kind of kind of they have this sentimental uh, kind of view so they will always share the china story china have high speed rail china have 5g all these things uh, uh, kind of very uh, so they didn't never filter so anything from china will be like they view as great so they just share kind of so they there was they, sometimes they've been pointed out by their family member or friends or, so they i mean said okay yeah i i admit that um, probably i share something not correct in the past go to the third question is about yating ask me about uh, any things about the pre-covid kind of thing um before this uh pandemics um there's a uh, in two in lead up in before the 2018 we Malaysia government passed a anti fake news law the reason for that is more political where we have uh, if some of you are aware that we uh, have one major scandal what called YNDB one Malaysia development uh, uh, scandal where involved uh, uh, in UK, in US in, in New York London and Singapore and many countries so the government tried to silence the, the opposition kind of be passing an anti fake news law try to uh silence the opposition and critics on that kind of thing. but that bill being repelled in 2019 after the new government uh, took over but again then uh, there are something like there's a new discussion about trying to have new regulation about some of these anti fake news kind of thing but uh it's kind of uh political because the uh, people view that uh, is it Again, so you try to silence the critics or if really you're protecting the freedom of expression kind of thing. So there are some of the, these things. So in the past, um, the fake news uh, propaganda was mostly uh, on disinformation, mostly on domestic politics issue. 
uh, opposition will accuse uh, ruling parties, uh, politicians of corruption, abuse of power, scandal, you know, all these things. Same, the ruling party politician will do this on the opposition. So before the COVID, uh, mostly are domestic driven. But after the 2020, and then a lot more this uh, pop up, uh, this international related kind of mix of and disinformation come into a domestic uh, the, 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 the user side thing. Then the last question uh, respond to the uh, uh, Dr. O'Neill. Um, yes, I we admit there's a limitation on some of the question. And actually the study that uh, we conduct is a very lengthy, lengthy uh, study, 60 to 70%. We also asked about some of these uh, knowledge questions, see whether how people uh, taps believe or don't, uh, don't believe some of these digital media fake news. So actually it's, the, the, it's quite consistent with the findings from, uh, from the, what we present just now. That's why I only uh, present some of these uh, early findings. We admit there's a uh, self filtering that people don't, uh, they try to give a, a, a social correct answer. We, we, we admit uh, that will be uh, the potential of that. We're also looking at some uh, new tools then fine tune can, can get the better uh, answer from, from it. But uh, again, but because of today's uh, discussion, we will try to highlight that uh, uh, why uh, the uh, Malaysian domestic uh, public will fall into some of this uh, international propaganda or disinformation is due to the, some of this, uh, their worldview, their, their values, the, and also some of these uh, uh, ideological uh, reasons for that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for the answer. I think we uh, in the document, we also have a couple of questions for uh, Ms. Kowala. Uh, like to how was asking uh, there's mm -hmm. like a new governmental uh, position in the MLD and is that part of the countermeasures that you mentioned and also Jason was asking uh, like how so uh, from the top how does the Japanese government deal with this kind of rumor related to natural disaster because as I, uh, as, as you mentioned I think it's quite similar to the situation in Taiwan whenever like Jihao mentioned, whenever there's an election, when, whenever we need to vote, there will be like rig vote related uh, rumors or disinformation in Taiwan. And in the Japanese cases, it might be like natural disaster. It's like reoccurring and then it will accompany like some uh, disinformation or ma information man manipulation. Uh, so how, how, how does the Japanese government deal with it? So uh, can I answer, Jeff? Yes, yes. Good question. Thank you so much for uh, your first question, Chihau. Do I pronounce? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, as you told me that uh, there's a report in Taiwanese uh, uh, saying that the uh, MOD is planning to develop the disinformation countermeasure efforts and create a new positions uh, called um global strategy strategic Inter intelligence officer and this is uh in order to uh, yeah, for the countering disinformation campaign conducted by other countries and also that the uh, mod is conducting those kind of efforts uh in the framework um of strategic uh, communication effort and they um, um are willing to prom promote their own strategic communication efforts, and they are planning to um, cooperate well with, uh, for, for instance, NATO Stratcom, uh, based in Liga um, this year. Also, the second question from uh, Jason, um, the false rumors uh, spread during the dis natural disasters in Japan, is uh, talking about those kind of um, issues was started um, since, has started since 2011, when the Great East Japan earthquake occurred, because the, uh, we couldn't, uh, they couldn't use um, uh, any traditional uh, communication method, for instance, phone, and emails and email and S SMS message messages. Uh, instead, only Twitters and Facebook um, uh, slightly worked at the time. So they started, uh, since then, we Japanese started uh, Twitters and um, uh, for the uh, 
like you know the normal uh, communication um, method. Uh, at the same time, the the uh, the communication new communication method has uh, provoked the uh, some of the issues of uh, false rumors spread uh, during the natural disasters, and for instance the uh let's say i told you that um, there is a false rumors uh spread 2011 and also other uh earthquake natural earthquake and also fire um things kind of thing um but those uh, um like you know uh those issues were handled by mick i i told you that the um, uh, ministry Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication in Japan, and this that that ministry is only tackling in um, internal uh, fake news, disinformation campaigns, and um, false rumors, not from uh, not disinformation campaigns conducted by other countries. So then, uh, talking about the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan, the activities is fo uh, very much focusing on public diplomacy activities uh, using soft power, for instance, the background of Japanese um, aware awareness of the countermeasures against the foreign influence operations um, on public opinion. There was some aggressive information warfare and psychological warfare conducted by other countries, including China and uh, South, um, South Korea, um, over the territorial issues and uh, historical recognitions. So that's why Japan's uh, uh, Abe administration at the time um, doubled its public diplomacy budget. Um, then they, um, the MOFA started uh, more um, you know, more uh, public diplomacy activities, but they are not conducting countermeasures against this information campaigns at, the, at this moment. So uh, we have to, you know, uh, create um, uh, the new agency or group uh, inside, the inside the government, which can supervise the disinformation campaigns from overseas as well. So last question is from uh, Yatin. Thank you. Um, does information and information manipulation make any change? Yes, I told you that, uh, as I mentioned now, that um, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese government's agencies and ministries are all realized, has all realized, uh, realized that disinformation countermeasures is essential. But um, at this moment, uh, the each agencies and each ministries uh, conduct is conducting exactly the different different uh, approaches against disinformation countermeasures. Uh, so this is the um, you know the huge, huge, huge uh, problem, and also. Um, yeah, homework for uh, all Japanese to uh, consider the uh, interagency efforts um, and also uh, learn from uh, other good um, method and lessons learned from other countries and regions, uh, for instance, in Ta from Taiwan. Thank you. Can I just add to that last one? Um, is, is, is the digital agency playing uh a role in facilitating, uh, as you said, horizontal ministry uh, communication in terms of coming up with a whole strategy against information manipulation? Um, digital uh, agency is um, maybe, uh, they are focusing on digital infrastructure, uh, the, the security of digital infrastructure. So, and also for instance, we have our uh, own numbers of uh, citizens that's not, uh, the, uh, yes, my ID. As, yeah. as national, yeah, ID, right? So they save those, uh, they secure those kind of thing, but there's no disinf um, countermeasures right. against disinformation uh, from overseas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then I think uh, all 
speakers have answered more or less uh, the end, uh, the questions that has been put here in the notes. Mm, okay then. Uh, I think I think I have San I have one question from Sana to me, quite long. Uh, Sana, do you mind just asking me? Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, there's one by uh, Sana to Chihao. Okay, let me read also. Yeah. <clears throat> Hmm. Thank you. Yes. I actually forgot about the question, so let me just go to <laughs> no the problem. Question. No problem. There's a lot of cursors <laughs> flying around on the back. Yeah. Yeah. No. And then I think uh, in all uh, the presentations, one common thing was that uh, uh, you were giving Taiwan's perspective, but uh, of course, as uh, Dr. Ni Nil also talked about it, that most of the countries face similar challenges. But I think most of the time what happens is that we don't talk to each other, specifically given Taiwan's uh, yeah. uh, status. And uh, coming from a regional country like India, I feel that we face similar challenges, specifically with the elections. Uh, EVM, the tempering of EVM is such a big issue, be it local elections or uh, uh, at different level elections. This becomes a very, very important uh, and uh, issue. So I believe, uh, and also uh, Taiwan has been facing the issue of disinformation that emanates from China and uh, the issue of uh, disinformation, fake news from Pakistan, uh, from our neighbors, and we don't share really cordial relations with our neighbors, Taiwan and India, we have similar issues with China as well. Uh, so I believe that uh, to be domestic challenges or external uh, challenges, countries like Taiwan, India, Japan, especially regional countries, we have similar challenges, but we really don't talk to each other. But Taiwan has been, and I live in Taiwan, and I have seen firsthand how, uh, especially uh, Minister Tang has been a face of uh, countering fake information. So, what are the lessons you would really uh, give to the Indian government or even Taiwanese government that you know we could really uh, cooperate with each other and answer these questions uh, together jointly? Also, I have one question for uh, the speaker from Japan. Uh, she talked. Uh, I know she's listening. Yes, Miss Kuahara san Yeah, I think I think yeah. we can take notes also for you. Go ahead. Thank you. So you talked about Quad and how Quad is also emerging as one. As at least they're trying to emerge as a source of uh, counting disinformation, specifically how it's coming from China and how uh, Quad has been labeled by different names in. Uh, uh, China by Chinese officials. Uh, so, of course, they are trying to counter fake information, uh, not just with respect to Quad, but also uh, with respect to what's happening in the region. And you mentioned that in your presentation. Uh, but I've been also advocating for the inclusion of Taiwan, not really in the Quad, but in the discussions. And specifically, when we talk about challenges in the cyber domain, fake information, information manipulation, I believe that Taiwan has some expertise. Then how do you uh, see Taiwan's inclusion, specifically how Japan and the US have been very supportive of Taiwan? Then how do you see in the field of fake information and uh, cyber cooperation, how Taiwan could be included within the Quad framework? Thank you. Oops. Oops. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments and uh, thoughts and comments and questions. Talking about the, um, the uh, like framework with um, the international framework to counter disinformation campaigns is uh, con is in there can be they can be considered for uh, each um, regions and each framework and we have uh, uh, lots of uh, like regional framework uh, with Japan for instance. Uh, we have a great good relationship with ASEAN countries. Also, we have good relationship with Taiwan, and we do have uh, uh, G7 members, Great Seven members, also Quad frameworks. So each um, each of those uh, uh, have great potential for all, uh, for Japanese, uh, so for Japan to um, conduct. Um, uh, or create a mechanism or I would say framework for um, for the um, disinformation countermeasures which fits or um, like yeah yeah I would say which fits to all region um, 
and uh, democracies. And uh, for instance, talking about the Japan and China, uh, Japan and Taiwan, uh, we do have a lot of uh, you know common uh, lessons learned, and uh, we have um, uh, the some issues related to uh, China, uh, to China, for instance. Uh, the, for instance, information. Uh, were uh, conducted by China. So we do uh, want to, some of the Japanese elites and researchers want to uh, con want to have a cooperation, uh, want to have a cooperation and coordination with Taiwan researchers and um, some NGOs and think tank to learn how they can combat uh, this information campaign. So each region and each framework and each um, uh, relationship uh, between bio bilateral re relationship uh, could be um, each own uh, framework, uh, potential framework and um, mechanism for uh, fight against this information. Thank you. And then for Sana's question, I think it's a very big question. Um, my initial thoughts, as shallow as they may be, I think uh, government cooperation and civil society exchange needs to be separated a little bit. Um, right now, we're seeing both happening. Uh, but since IORG is a civilian organization, we don't have intelligence about like how governments are cooperating with each other. But I do have a comment for or a suggestion for the governments in the region is that they need to be as open as possible uh, because we think Fundamentally, the, 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 the issue here is public trust to in, in, in our institutions. So they need to be as open and inclusive in terms of respecting the diversity of each country's democracy and people. So I think that's one main uh, theme, where, you know, connecting it to, you know, civic tech movements from 2012 in the region. Uh, talking about open government and now there's an open par government partnership, but are, are they actually open to uh, different ideas and very sometimes conflicting um, voices in the civil society. I think that's something that uh, our governments need to be better at. Um, civilians at first, I think it issues or events such as today uh, highlights the difficulty and the necessity of these kind of exchanges because for my experience to listen to, listening to all of you sharing your countries uh, your, your own experience in your own country, it's it's really difficult, right, to switch between contexts and to think of a good question to ask to facilitate uh, for the understanding, let alone cooperation. So or my, I would, I mean, I think uh, a more in, informal setting and then allowing like a more free exchange of ideas would be, would benefit, would, would be beneficial to all of us. Um, like I would love to share like on our uh, unfinished research with, with all of you and asking for your comments. And I think by sharing more more frequently and more openly, I think maybe that's that's the way to go. Maybe that's just my, my personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with Zhihao. Actually, so uh, one of the purpose that we organize this kind of like casual summer briefing is exactly because we want to facilitate uh, future cooperation between like uh, like-minded partners. Like this is the first time we did this kind of event with our uh, like friends in the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, like if we want to uh, talk more about the educational front, then maybe we can also like uh, contact Professor Matthew a bit later uh, to see how we can actually like exchange our, our approaches because in Taiwan, uh, IORG also did some workshops at schools and we also have like developed a uh, school curriculum with uh, teachers all across Taiwan. I think that's also like a very interesting and could be beneficial experience for, for you as well. And okay, I think we can, uh, uh, Singa, do you want to ask uh, some more questions or do you have any comments? Oh, I, I just noticed that I did only answer one part to the question for Yating and try, I try to respond to the second one and in a quick way. Uh, first question about any change of the foreign policy, I would say no for now. At least uh, all this uh, if disinformation or fake news kind of thing didn't change any of the Malaysia foreign policy for now. So the political elites is uh, doing their uh, own kind of thing, uh, trying to ask Malaysia 
a small country you try to balance between china and us and yeah we security side we are working more to the west but in terms of business you try to do a lot of business with china so the country try to managing with uh, a balance between these two so the all this information doesn't have any impact on the foreign policy and about any suggestion or transnational information research i will just share a little bit more uh, we currently also working with one of the uh, think tank from Taiwan about more related to the China uh, kind of propaganda and uh, disinformation campaign. But besides that, um, some of our colleagues, uh, friends in the CSO, they're also working with the Indonesia side on uh, some of this anti-fake news, anti-disinformation uh, campaign, uh, more on the capacity building on how to do fact check kind of thing because Malaysia and Indonesia are mostly a Muslim population. So on that Muslim side, we have a lot more of these kind of Islamic uh, kind of related kind of fake news ongoing. Example would be like during some of the Rohingya crisis, if we had got a lot of these uh, recycled uh, scary photos from other kind of crisis, say, oh, this is how Rohingya be treated and all these things. So that is on the Malaysia, Indonesia, on the more on the Muslim side. But uh, as a region, I would say that um, the government or some of these politicians are trying to pressure all the big tech company like facebook and google to have more responsible to some of these uh, how they operate the business here in the country in the region and because indonesia is a big market for this some of these big tech so they're spending quite a lot of resource in the so-called this um, media literacy kind of research or kind of how is that kind of uh, defense teams on on some of these fake news things uh, I know that some of these big big techs are hiring a lot of people and based in Kuala Lumpur. Although they are servicing the market in India, Middle East, and even they are, they are some are hiring, uh, there's a new hiring for especially on Taiwan market, but they're all based in Kuala Lumpur. So these are some of the, these, uh, um, I think maybe the, this is more on the government side, try to how to pressure the big tech company to have more responsible kind of how they conduct the business in the region stuff like that. and uh, think tank research institute cso i think there's more on the non-government side i think we need to share our experience i think indonesia are doing a good job in terms of fact check and some of these things and in future probably we can invite some of the uh, friends from indonesia to share their experience thank you okay thank you thank you for your uh, quick response um, oh yeah, I was just curious that you mentioned that you are also working with one Taiwanese think tank. Uh, may I ask, like, which one is Double that? Think. Ah, cool. Okay, <laughs> not too surprised. Anyway, okay, uh, it's like almost uh, two fifty right now, and I think we can sort of write up the the event right now. Just want to thank you Sorry. all for. Oh yeah. So I just wanted to say I put a link in the chat. It's the Google's. Um, Russia-Ukraine conflict misinfo dashboard. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's really pretty cool. Uh, basically, oh, wow. they kind of um, review claims, um, you know, and then they, uh, they they provide a rating and they provide the the source. So it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's 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 only on this one issue because somebody was asking if there's other sources you could use to fact check. So that that would be for that topic, you could use that, right? Uh, but once again, it's not encyclopedic, so that's why. But uh, just just on my part, I just wanted to say thanks a lot. It's been really interesting, and uh, sure, I'd be happy to chat more about the education stuff uh, offline. So just just write to me, and we can see what we can do. Uh, but thanks, everybody. It was really nice to meet you. Every meet everybody. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Cool. Thank you for sharing the link. Actually, for for us, uh, when I want to find like examples of. Uh, information manipulation regarding the ongoing Ukrainian uh, Russian war, I would just go to like EU VSD Info. I think that's one of the main projects funded by the European Union, and they publish like tons of uh, reports on, and analysis on that. And they collect, I think they report, they also have a daily report on all those kind of examples that they collect. And I think it's also very useful if you want to know more about what's happening in Ukraine, especially in Ukraine right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Of, of course. Like, if you want to, if everyone wants to share any link, uh, just for information, you can also put that in the Google document on the event notes. So, uh, I think we will keep that open for the moment, and all uh, all the particip participants can still uh, add inside and 
uh, whatever comments you want to what you want to put in, we'll we'll keep it open, and then hopefully, as Zhihao mentioned right at the beginning, uh, from our side, we will prob probably publish one like short article about all the key points that we that we learn from you uh, during the event and put it on our website. And I think uh, from the side of TAF, they will also produce like a short policy uh, brief briefing on that. And if you are interested, we can definitely like uh, email all those things to you afterwards. And I hope today's event is like useful, beneficial to you and hope we can organize something similar soon or not until next. Thank you for your presentation again. Okay, and then that's it. Hope you have a wonderful uh, afternoon then. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. You too.